Hello, Bio 50. We are going to talk about the nervous system today, and I have to admit, this is one of the chapters that I love the most. This is what my graduate degree is in, so let's have some fun. Love the brain. So the nervous system is broken into two different divisions, the central and the peripheral. Now the autonomic that you're seeing here, this th third section, we'll get to that later, okay? Basically what the central nervous system is, is the brain and the spinal cord, okay? And we've already kind of looked at that in terms of looking at the bones. The peripheral nervous system are all the nerves that go out to the um, muscles and glands of the body, controls the body. Autonomic nervous system, that is like kind of its own chapter because the way I think about the autonomic nervous system is it's the automatic nervous system. All the stuff that you do involuntarily, like breathing and your heart rate and uh, setting your blood pressure. So when you're thinking of the nervous system, break it apart first in the two basic subdivisions, central and peripheral. And then within the peripheral, you have autonomic and somatic. Sensory is sensation, feeling. Okay, so let's start with the functional part of the nervous system. The functional unit of the nervous system is a type of cell called a neuron. And when you go and look at your uh, virtual slide box this week, you're gonna see uh, a few slides showing you uh, the classic neuron which you're seeing down here. So the neuron has a large cell body relative to its axon. The axon is this long stem structure. In this artist's rendition here, you can also see that the uh, cell body or the soma is large. The axon's like a long tail. The dendrites are where information comes in, okay? So what's going on in the nervous system? Information is being processed. Information comes from one cell to the next via the dendrites. So information comes in to the dendrites. Information goes out through the axon. So the artist rendition here sometimes is a little easier to look at information flow. So here's information in, information out, all the way to the end. All right. Uh, rather than looking at a, a microscope slide. So, so cell body, cell body or soma. The nucleus in a neuron is usually quite large. The dendrites are, kind of, they look kind of like uh, wispy hairs. They look much more wispy in the picture here than in the uh, photomicrograph over here. However, um, there are a lot of different configurations of dendritic uh, trees. We call them dendritic trees on top of, on top of neurons. Um, and then we have the axon, like I mentioned before. Surrounding the axon are these pieces of myelin called Schwann cells. The Schwann cells insulate the axon, and we'll talk, to, talk about that more in a little bit. So neurons themselves are classified in terms of what they do, their function. You have sensory neurons, which conduct uh, information uh, to the spinal cord and then to the brain. So that's info in. You have motor neurons, which take information out, okay, from the brain out to muscles and glands and so forth via the spinal cord. And then you have these other things called interneurons. These guys are kind of weird because they are uh, kind of like switches on railroad tracks. They can turn on one neuron while turning the other one off. It's a part of processing. Uh, we'll get to that later. Now, there is another type of cell in the central nervous system called a glial cell. So we were back here, neurons. Neurons, the functioning electrical part of the uh, nervous system. And the glia, also sometimes called neuroglia, which are also called supporting cells. These are the cells that help keep the environment in the nervous system healthy and happy, okay? They uh, hold nervous system tissue together. They uh, absorb extra calcium if there's lots of calcium around. Um, and believe it or not, calcium is toxic to neurons. So too much calcium in your brain can give you an issue. Now, don't worry about that. You're never gonna drink so much milk that you're gonna give yourself neurotoxicity in your brain. That It's a different thing. Um, so there are three types, main types of glia in the brain. There are the astrocytes. The astrocytes are these, they're called astrocytes because they look like stars, astro here. And what's really cool about them is they hang on to capillaries. What they do is they actually form the blood brain barrier. So here's a capillary. Capillaries are made up, I'm sorry, this just keeps pulling up this note. 
Uh, capillaries are made up of thin, thin endothelial cells. They're basically squamous epithelial cells with gaps. And it, to ensure that things don't leak out of the bloodstream into the brain, the astrocytes wrap the blood vessels, the capillaries, to keep them from leaking. We have microglia. Microglial cells are kind of like the white blood cells in the nervous system, but they're not actually white blood cells. They go around and they look for junk in the brain, uh, inflammation, dead cells, and they consume them via phagocytosis. So they just consume dead things in the brain. And hopefully we don't have a whole lot of dead things in there. The last thing in the brain are the oligodendrocytes, and the oligodendrocytes are the cells that make myelin along the lengths of axons in the brain. Now, what's interesting is myelin sheaths insulate neurons, right? So we looked at that here. Each one of these Schwann cells make myelin. Schwann cells are in the peripheral nervous system, PNS. In the brain and in the central nervous system, we have oligodendrocytes. Okay, or oligodendroglia, but most people call them oligodendrocytes. They are a separate type of cell because a single oligodendrocyte can wrap several axons at the same time, but it does the same thing. It insulates and forms the myelin sheath along the length of axons in the brain. So one interesting thing, or uh, I guess, you know, kind of interesting thing about uh, nervous tissue is that there are multiple types of disorders that can occur due to degradation of myelin specifically. Multiple sclerosis is a type of disease where myelin in the central nervous system or in the peripheral, peripheral nervous system gets damaged through inflammation. So over here in this picture, you can see the oligodendrocytes uh, myelinating one, two, three axons here. These are nice, healthy blobs of myelin uh, encasing each one of these axons. Sometimes uh, what will happen is due to disease process, we'll just call it disease process right now, the oligodendrocytes get damaged and the myelin, the pieces of myelin get degraded. And when that happens, uh, you lose, lose that insulation along the length of the mile of the axon, and that actually slows down axon conduction or electrical conduction. And what that means is that one cell finds it very difficult to send an electro electrical impulse to the next cell. So that's what happens during multiple sclerosis. You have basically a situation where the myelin becomes damaged. Tumors, uh, different kinds of tumors like a neuroma, um, many neuromas are, are made out of uh, glial tumors. Even though it's neuro, uh, it just means that you ha it's a tumor of the nervous system. So uh, neurofibromatosis is basically a bunch of little benign tumors that form along the length of uh, axons. And sometimes they'll, they'll push out on the body and you can see the little tumorous masses. They don't necessarily hurt you, but they're not great either. Now let's talk about nerves themselves. Nerves are bundles of axons out in outside of the central nervous system. So that means outside of the brain or the spinal cord. So we call that peripheral, okay? Outside of the brain and the spinal cord is the peripheral nervous system. A nerve is just a bundle of these axons going somewhere. A tract is a bundle of axons in the central nervous system. So basically a nerve tract is a big bunch of nerves in the central nervous system, in the brain or the spinal cord. Um, so the way I think about it is a tract is like a bunch of bungee cords clumped together with like duct tape, okay? That would be a fiber tract. A bunch of nerves would be like a bunch of bungee cords held together, but dangling loose, you know, not taped together. Um, it just, We'll look at some nerves and fiber tracts, I think, in a few minutes here when we uh, proceed to some of the next slides. Now, white matter and gray matter in the brain consist of the cells or the myelinated axons. So white matter is basically your nerves or the tracts inside the brain. Gray matter are the actual neurons, the cell bodies, and or unmyelinated fibers. There are not that many of them, but they are in the brain. Sometimes you'll see uh, an axon without myelin. So here's an example of a nerve. So this nerve on the outside has a casing called the epineurium. Remember, epi always means like outside, most superficial. Inside of the epineurium, you're gonna find vascularization. You'll maybe find uh, some lymphatic drainage in a few spaces. Uh, there's usually some fat in a nerve. 
to insulate and so forth. And then you have all of these individual axons here. So the epineurium is the big outer covering. The fascicle is the group surrounded by what we call the perineurium. So that's kind of the, the intermediate wrapping. And then you have the endoneurium, which surrounds the Schwann cells and the uh, actual axons themselves. Each Schwann cell in the peripheral nervous system has a single nucleus. So try to remember the endoneurium surrounds each individual nerve fiber. The perineurium surrounds the fascicle, a group of nerve fibers, and the epineurium surrounds the entire nerve. So what's great about these nerves is that they're really efficient at conducting electrical activity quickly. Nerve impulses or action potentials uh, are, can, are first started when a receptor uh, gets activated. So in this example here, it's kind of a stretched picture, I'm sorry. This is a patellar reflex. So what, what's happening here is you have a stimulus right here, the reflex hammer tapping on the patellar tendon underneath the patella. And what that does is it, as this tendon gets tapped and move inwards, it pulls on the uh, tendons, the quadriceps tendons up here, stretching the stretch receptors in the quad muscles, okay? As that happens, that information travels up through what we call the dorsal root ganglia, interacts with cells inside the spinal cord. This is an interneuron. So the interneuron says, hey, something just happened. If we want to, if the, if the reflex, this simple uh, disynaptic reflex, this one's a monosynaptic, it's disynaptic when you end up interactivating the interneuron, but different story. Uh, if you turn on the motor neuron here, what will happen is this muscle will contract and you'll kick out a little bit. You'll have the response number two, okay? And all of this happens because you stretched this stretch receptor in the quadriceps muscles. Now, this simple uh, two neuron arc, so this is one, two, um, is a simple reflex arc. The trisynaptic arc, okay, the three neuron arc, has a lot to do with telling this not to turn on. Don't worry about why the interneuron would be doing that right now. That happens actually when you're walking, but don't worry about that. So how do nerve impulses actually travel? You guys, I spent one whole semester in graduate school understanding this in detail. You guys don't have to do that. But what you do need to know is the basic principle of nerve propagation. Nerve propagation is where the electricity which is a chemical signal in this case, travels from one end of the axon to the next, and it never travels backwards, which is an interesting phenomenon. So what happens here is something happens in the neuron that triggers the opening of what we call sodium channels, and literally sodium just flows into the cell. Sodium goes into the cell body, okay? What that does is it pushes sodium ions down through the axon. And as that happens, you do have, uh, it, that initiates this positive electrical charge going down the axon really fast. So it's this positive charge of sodium being transmitted underneath the myelin sheath that sends the signal to the next cell. It is way more complicated than that. It is like, I mean, like I said, I spent a whole semester studying this. It, it's really complicated. Um, but if you ever get a chance, it's really cool and super interesting. Now, how do you start a nerve impulse? At the synapse, um, one cell talks to the next cell. So over here, we have the presynaptic cell. And over here, we have the postsynaptic cell. Basically, what's happening, let's go back one slide. In order for sodium to enter our presynaptic cell here, okay, that first neuron, well, let me do this. In order for sodium, let's make this our cell. Okay, we'll call this the presynaptic cell because it's gonna send sodium in that direction, okay, down. In order for sodium to rush in, you have to trigger that to happen. And this is a part of that, you know, one semester long course I took. What happens is this axon is going to touch our cell here. And what it does is it dumps or exocytoses little molecules of neurotransmitter. When the neurotransmitter touches these channels, that allows sodium to go into the cell.
okay? So we call these gated channels. And so that initiates all the sodium coming in. So basically, the little blue neurotransmitter packets here are ringing the doorbell, allowing sodium to enter the cell. As that happens, you get an activation of an action potential. So there are a lot of different kinds of neurotransmitters that happen at different synapses, acetylcholine or uh, catecholamines, uh, which are also norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, endorphins, and kephalins, nitric oxides, actually, and other compounds like dop uh, dopamine. I already said dopamine. Uh, what's another good one? Well, we said enkephalins, um, GABA. Um, these are all neurotransmitters that are going to do jobs in the central nervous system. Now, what happens when these uh, neurotransmitters don't work properly? Then we have a situation like Parkinson's disease. Now, what happens in Parkinson's disease is that uh, through a disease process, you have abnormally low levels of dopamine in areas of the brain that keep you from trembling. All right, so dopamine actually stops you from tremoring. And as the dopamine goes away, tremoring becomes more prevalent. And <clears throat> as time goes on, with less and less dopamine, the tremors get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then eventually what happens is the muscles become very rigid, okay? It, uh, you're, it's not like you're flapping your arms around anymore. The muscles just get locked into place and it's very painful and very uncomfortable. So going back one slide, the proper functioning of neurotransmitters to allow sodium into cells are what allow these cells to send signals to the next cell in line. And when that gets blocked, you end up with disease process in the central nervous system. So let's go and talk about the basic divisions of the brain. You can definitely break up, break up the brain into much smaller divisions, but for this class, we're just gonna look at basic divisions of the brain. We have the brainstem, which is made up of three parts, the medulla oblongata, okay, which is the brainstem itself, the longest part, the pons, and the midbrain. The pons are a uh, part of some visual processing, but the pons have a lot of fiber tracks connecting the cerebellum and motor pathways up in the cerebrum. And then the midbrain regulates, um, it's kind of like a, it's the center of the brain that makes sure you're doing what you think you're doing. It's, it's complicated. Um, the structure of the brain, white matter or fiber tracts, hold the gray matter in place, all right? Now, how does that happen? Well, the fiber tracts, again, are long axons extending outwards from uh, gray matter. And the fiber tracts actually help hold neurons in place where they need to be. Having said that, um, the absence of fiber tracts in disease conditions uh, allows neurons to kind of spread out more, I guess you could say. Um, for, in, for this course, though, you only need to really work on white matter, axons, fiber tracts, gray matter, actual neurons, um, and I guess you would say kind of the thinking units of the brain. Now, the function of the brain, gray matter uh, in the brainstem works to do basically a bunch of reflexes. Why are reflexes important? Reflexes keep you out of trouble. It keeps you from hurting yourself. You don't have to, you don't have to, it, it'll, reflexes will allow you to do things automatically. It's a little different from autonomic though. Um, other, uh, reflex centers and regulatory centers would keep your breathing going normally, blood vessel diameter normal. If you stand up too quickly, you might feel a little dizzy because your blood pressure may have dropped, but then parts of your brainstem will, will signal blood vessels to change their tension, the smooth muscle to change their tension so that the blood vessels uh, constrict a bit and your blood pressure goes back up and you don't pass out. Sensory tracts in the brainstem take information up to higher areas of the brain. And when we say higher areas, that usually means the cerebrum, uh, the parts of the brain where decisions are made and coordination of movement happens. So here's a picture showing us the spinal cord in yellow, okay, the medulla oblongata in pink, the pons in green, which is associated with another region right here, which is heading on up to the midbrain. Uh, here's the cerebellum in blue. Here's the midbrain up here in kind of like, I don't know, kind of a yellowy color. It's tannish, I guess. 
In purple, we have the hypothalamus, which is attached to the pituitary down here. The pituitary is continuous with the hypothalamus. Uh, the pituitary and the hypothalamus help control what we call goal-directed behaviors like thirst, uh, hunger, the urge to sleep, uh, reproductive urges, uh, rage actually is also regulated through the hypothalamus. We have the corpus callosum. Now, I wish that they would have made the corpus callosum here a totally different color, but they didn't. The corpus callosum is the wiring that holds the right and the left hemispheres together. And then the orange part here is the cerebral cortex. Mam uh, mammals have the largest cerebral cortex or cortices of all animals on the planet. And actually dolphins have proportionally more cerebral cortex than humans. And they stay and play in the water all the time. So who's not to say that dolphins aren't smarter than humans? I don't know. So over here, you're looking at a cross section uh, of a uh, prepared human brain. You'll see that the cerebellum is down at the base of the brain. I kind of think it looks like a cauliflower cut in half. Over here, we have the, uh, um, the occipital lobe. This is where we, uh, it allows us to see vision. We'll talk about that a little bit more in, the, uh, in a little bit. And then we have these long fissures separating segments of the brain. Fissures are kind of like big valleys. Small valleys are called sulky and the bumps are called gyri. So all these little wrap, all these gyri and sulci are intended to increase the surface area of the cerebrum in the brain. If you have more surface area, that means you have more neurons. You have more neurons, you have more computing power. In other words, you've just upgraded your, uh, your memory in your brain. The more cerebrum you have, the better working memory you have. It's basically like more RAM. So that was the brainstem. The diencephalon is part of what contains the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, the pituitary stalk, and, the, and some gray matter. Basically, the pituitary, like I said, helps control these goal-directed behaviors, which are autonomic behaviors, all right? There is some control of hormone secretion here. Um, some of the hormones would be things like, um, oh, vasopressin, um, Oxytocin is a big one. Oxytocin is very, very important in uh, for nursing females. Uh, oxytocin allows the milk letdown reflex to happen so that the baby can eat. Um, and other pituitary hormones are going to control uh, endocrine glands of the body. We're going to talk about that separately in a totally different chapter because that's a, a huge subject. Um, again, the hypothalamus helps control wakefulness, appetite to some degree, but also pleasure and anxiety and stress. It's also part of the limbic system, but that's a different system. Um, the diencephalon itself, as it says, is kind of like a dumbbell-shaped mass uh, in the thalamic section of the diencephalon, so that's the thalamus. And what that does is it, it sends information to the cerebral cortex in what we call sensory areas. Now, what is the, the thalamus doing? Whenever you speak, your brain has to make an approximation of how your vocal cords are going to work and how your mouth is going to work, how your tongue is going to move so that you can make words, so you can enunciate. What happens is before all of that ha can even happen, there's a whole signal in your brain, a sig signal cascade that starts in premotor cortex that goes to your motor cortex telling you how you're going to move your mouth to say, let's say, B, B. That information is going to be sent to your thalamus. The thalamus is going to say, uh, yep, that's how we do it, B. Thalamus then sends it back up to motor cortex, which then sends it down your spinal, well, not your spinal cord. In this case, it would go out of a cranial nerve uh, to your lips so you could say, B. And so that's what the thalamus is doing. It's double checking that you're doing things right in the nervous system to accomplish the motor tasks that you need to do. It's crazy. If that doesn't happen, then you have what we call motor mismatch. If the thalamus isn't doing its job, then instead of saying b b b appropriately because the thalamus double checked, you might go b p g g b g. You'd start mixing things up. And in people who have certain types of diseases, that happens. Um, there are other relays that go to the cerebral cortex and other sensory areas, but basically the idea is the thalamus is a proofreading center for the information going out. It also helps us uh, evaluate emotions or produce emotions like pleasantness, unpleasantness, 
And those are always associated with a sensation. So it's kind of like when you put your hands in slimy goo, you might like it. That you, that might actually feel good to you or like really slimy. What I don't like is slimy seaweed, like gooey old slimy seaweed with the bugs in it. Ugh, creepy. Um, makes me go, ugh. Thalamus is part of saying, yeah, remember, you didn't like that last time. You probably still don't. So over here, when we come back to this particular picture, uh, we're going to look over here in the midbrain. Hypothalamus is here. Here's the thalamus right here in the middle. Okay, cerebellum. Cerebellum is the second largest portion of the brain. Now remember, cerebrum is the biggest. What cerebellum does is allow us to undergo motor movements smoothly and help us maintain our posture. So basically the cerebellum is associated with motor memory. So in somebody who plays guitar or, so, or a stringed instrument and they're using their fingers to make notes on a fretboard, right, or chords, part of what makes that happen smoothly, all those smooth transitions, especially when they're playing fast, is the cerebellum has memorized how to do that. It's pretty amazing. Um, it turns out that in some, in musicians, again, uh, who play instruments where their left hand is doing fine motor movement like a guitar player or a violin player, um, the cerebellum actually helps the cerebrum make, the, make those positions happen faster and more, I guess you would say, uh, accurately than if it was just the motor system doing it alone. How do you do that? It's really mean, but what they have done is you can, <laughs> it sounds terrible, you can put a series of electrodes on the outside of the brain of students, usually it's college students, and they asked them to play guitar, and they were guitar players, and they put electrodes on the back, and when they would shock the electrode, it would shock the back of their head while they were playing, and it would interrupt the effectiveness of their fingers actually hitting a particular chord. Maybe it was because it hurt. I don't know. That was the evidence. So right here in blue is the cerebellum. The cerebrum, like I said, is the largest part of the brain. The outer layer is all gray matter, so all nerve, nerve cells. We call that the cerebral cortex. It is made up of many lobes. We, you know, frontal lobe, parietal, temporal, and so forth. We'll look at that in a minute. Lots of dendrites, lots of cell bodies, lots of axons, which also means lots and lots of fiber tracts, okay? So inside of the cerebrum, you're going to find lots of white matter. So cells on the outside, nerves on the inside, or tracts on the inside. Um, basically, what is the cerebrum doing? In addition to motor movement and sensing things, right, feeling the wind, feeling temperature, and so forth, this is a part of what generates our consciousness, our memory, our voluntary movements, um, our associations. Um, I don't know if this was the class that I told I got a concussion a couple of years ago, and it was in, the, in my parietal cortex. Um, I hit my head really, really hard, and I couldn't bring together two different like I, I saw a tablecloth and I knew the word tablecloth, but I didn't know that tablecloth meant tablecloth. It was weird. And so the cerebrum again is this large orange area. So brain disorders give us an idea about what each area of the brain does. Okay. How can you, you know, I mean, it sounds kind of mean, but if something happens, you can actually study how the brain works by looking at mistakes or disorders. So cerebrova a cerebrovascular accident, CVA, is basically a hemorrhage or stroke in the brain. What that does is it can destroy brain tissue if the blood flow is not restored or if um, there's loss of, if the blood flow, if the stroke is large enough, that not, not enough oxygen is delivered to cells and then the cells eventually die. In a CVA, if somebody loses uh, enough brain matter or enough brain cells, you can say, okay, this is the part of the brain that's no longer functional. What's, how is this evidencing itself in dysfunction of the brain? Okay. And usually a CVA happens in cerebral blood vessels. Cerebral palsy is something that happens when the motor part of the brain, when we say motor, that's the, the, those are the neurons controlling skeletal muscles where they get, uh, this is where damage happens to those parts of the brain. Cerebral palsy happens usually after, shortly after birth. Sometimes it happens because um, the baby doesn't start breathing quickly enough. Sometimes it could happen because um, the baby is somehow injured and so forth. And what ends up happening is that it causes long-term paralysis 
in uh, one or more of the limbs. So if the baby is born not breathing, part of the motor cortex could die, and that means that those neurons are not going to be telling skeletal muscles to contract and to control them, and the skeletal muscle just kind of atrophies. Another type of nervous system disorder is dementia. This is the progressive loss of memory uh, that happens over people's lifespan. Now, dementia, boy, 20, 30 years ago was just thought of as, oh, you know, the brain's not working well. Dementia has been broken into different ca uh, categories now, like Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's disease, seizure disorders, epilepsy. There are a lot of different types of um, dementia now. Alzheimer's, one that we all hear a lot about, it happens, it can start in the middle of life, like maybe about 50 and 60, but individuals developing Alzheimer's may not know it because their brain has not suffered severe enough uh, neuron loss yet. It's typically characterized as dementia later in life. People with Alzheimer's have um, difficulty recognizing things. They have memory uh, deficits. They also have issues with emotions. Huntington's disease is a little bit different because it's um, characterized as uh, a disease where people start moving, um, but without purpose, like their arm will just fly, fly around. It's called chorea. And so as time goes on, this purposeless movement, they'll just, you know, they swing their arm around, they'll stop doing that entirely um, as the dementia process continues. Seizure disorders are, this is unique because it can be a dementia process or a seizure disorder due to epilepsy, uh, which is a series of chronic reoccurring seizures over the life of the individual. And basically what happens is in some parts of the brain, all of a sudden you'll get a bunch of neurons that just start firing wildly for no reason. At least we don't know why. And so that changes period for a period of time brain function, and it can actually uh, change how the person behaves in given situations. People with seizure disorders are not supposed to drive because if they have a seizure while they're driving, they could wreck their car, they could hurt somebody else. They're not supposed to fly a plane. It's a, it's a, very, it's a very dicey situation. So how do, you, um, how do you diagnose a seizure? So usually what they'll do is just put somebody in a machine called an ECG um, and they put electrodes on the person's brain. And that's what you're seeing here in this picture. This lady has electrodes taped to her brain, or not to her brain, her forehead. And what they're doing is they're recording electrical activity that's coming from uh, neurons in her cerebral cortex. And so when a seizure happens, it's characterized by this wild uh, burst of activity inside of neurons in her brain. So the ECG, the electroencephalogram, is a graphic representation of the voltage change in her brain as a consequence of neurons firing off it, uh, kind of inappropriately. Okay, so we're going to move on to the spinal cord now. Okay, I know this is a long chapter, but that's okay. We're halfway through this. The spinal cord um, connects to the brain via the medulla oblongata, okay, brainstem, and it's broken into several regions. The cervical region, oops, let me get my pencil working again, cervical, the thoracic, the lumbar, the sacral, and then the coccyx or the tailbone at the end, okay? The cervical vertebra are C1 through C7. Thoracic is T1 through T12. Lumbar is L1 through L5. And then you have sacral, okay? We just call them sacral. And associated with each ver uh, vertebra, you have a pair of nerves. So there are eight cervical nerves, 12 thoracic nerves, five lumbar nerves, and five sacral nerves, all right? Basically what's happening here is each one of these uh, regions is extending an axon out to muscles and glands and what we call effectors out in the peripheral part of the body, the periphery. This picture here on the, on the right is showing the spinal cord with nerves, which we call dorsal roots, attached to ganglia, which are the dorsal root ganglia. These are clusters of nerve cells going out to the periphery of the body. What's going on here? 
these regulate the spinal cord reflexes. Uh, these regulate those reflexes if you put your hand on uh, something hot and you pull away real quick. That helps regulate that real quick reaction so you don't damage your body. The spinal cord itself is a, you know, they always say a butterfly shaped organ. What you're looking at here in this picture or this drawing of the spinal cord is uh, the region minus the bone. Okay, this is minus the vertebra. So you would have actually the big body of the vertebra underneath this here. Okay, I'm going to get rid of my circle there. So the central canal right here in the middle contains cerebral spinal fluid. The butterfly shape in the middle are all neurons, okay? The kind of pink area over here is the white matter. Those are axons. Those are axon tracks that are ascending, okay, info in, and the descending is info out. In other words, the ascending is afferent information. I'm going to write it down. Afferent info in so this is coming in from like your skin so let's say you do touch something hot this is the afferent info coming in from thermoreceptors on your hand going to your spinal cord and then up to your brain so that's ascending information descending uh, is efferent which equals info out Okay, I really wish this was flat for me to write on. I'm so sorry, you guys. Descending information from the brain is that motor activity. Now, it can also be information going out from the ventral horn. We'll talk about that in a little bit. The spinal nerves in the peripheral nervous system consist of the ventral root, which would be down here, the dorsal root, which is up here, and then the dorsal root ganglion, which we don't we don't have in this picture here. We'll look at that in a minute. Oh, we'll look at it here. So here's the spinal cord. See, here it is, the body of the vertebra. Here are the different wrappings, the, uh, the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, the pia mater. They all surround the spinal cord. Here's the butterfly in pink. Over here is the dorsal root. Over here is the ventral root, okay? And uh, the spinal nerves are associated with the spinal ganglia, and then over here along the side are the sympathetic ganglia. We'll talk about that when we talk about the autonomic nervous system, okay? So sympathetic ganglia are really important for turning on things like fight or flight. So what's the function of spinal cord? Spinal reflexes and movement, okay? Conducts impulses to and from the brain. What would happen if the spinal cord were severed? Well, information wouldn't go past the site where the cut was made and that would lead to uh, paralysis. Oops, sorry about that. So let's talk about the coverings of the brain. We talked about it just briefly there, the dura mater. The brain and the spinal cord have special coverings to help protect it and to protect them and to keep the uh, cerebral spinal fluid from leaking out. These coverings uh, include, of course, the cranial bones and vertebrae, but the tissues are the dura mater, which really means tough mother, the arachnoid mater, which look like spider webs, and then the pia mater. Pia mater is the closest to the cerebral cortex. The dura mater is the farthest away. The fluid spaces over here outlined in blue are called the, um, the uh, ventricles of the brain, and they, they contain also cerebral spinal fluid. And down here, this little segment here, is the central canal connected to the fourth ventricle, which connects up to the third ventricle and the lateral ventricles of the brain. There's a, um, a tissue called choroid plexus. The choroid plexus actually makes the uh, cerebral spinal fluid from uh, blood plasma. Believe it or not, everything comes from blood plasma, actually. It's really interesting. If you ever take my course at the college, we could talk about that. Um, but basically, the cerebral spinal fluid helps maintain the internal pressure of the brain. Uh, helping to cushion it, helping to support it internally. So the cerebral spinal fluid circulates around through the ventricles, through the central canal, but also underneath the dura and the arachnoid, within the dura and the arachnoid mater. Those are called the meninges. The dura, the arachnoid, and the pia mater are the meninges. 
filtering the blood through specialized, specialized tissue, that cord plexus, uh, or filtering of the plasma, I guess I should say, allows the production of cerebral spinal fluid to be drained into uh, regions of the dura. Let's just put it that way. Now, in terms of um, how that connects to the peripheral nervous system, we saw that picture of how the spinal cord is surrounded by all of the wrappings of the brain, right? Those wrappings do not extend farther than the spinal cord, okay? The nerves have their epineurium, endoneurium, all that stuff associated with them. So the dura, the pia, and the arachnoid mater don't go out onto the nerves. The cranial nerves, we talked about them already, 12 pairs. And remember, when we talk about nerves, they're pairs. Vertebra are singular, the nerves are pairs. Um, they're attached to the undersurface of the brain. They connect to the brain and some of the portions of the thorax and the abdomen. We didn't see the cranial nerves on the picture of the spinal cord because these are associated with the brain itself. The spinal nerves is what we just looked at a few minutes ago. So here are the cranial nerves. Do you need to memorize them all? If you're going to take anatomy at the college, you probably want to at least uh, memorize all of these now because it'll save you time later. The olfactory nerve is nerve one. It's associated with smell. The optic nerve is associated with vision. Oculomotor nerve uh, allows your eyes to coordinate their movement, the eye muscles. The trochlear nerve, again, another motor eye muscle um, nerve. Uh, trigeminal nerve has a lot to do with um, talking, facial expression, uh, chewing also, smiling. Abductans nerve, motor and eye muscles. Again, why do you think there's so many nerves associated with the eye? Because the eye does a lot, right? Um, the facial nerve has a lot to do with taste, motor to face muscles. Uh, Vestibulocochlear nerve is hearing and, val uh, hearing and balance. The glossopharyngeal glossopharyngeal nerve, I can never say this one, glossopharyngeal nerve is taste, motor, and swallowing. Vagus nerve, oh Lord, Lord in heaven, the vagus nerve is a uh, visceral sensation, motor commands to viscera. The vagus nerve is what gets activated and might make you pass out if you get punched in the stomach. Um, the accessory nerve sends uh, c commands, and the accessory nerve is nerve number 11, okay, uh, sends uh, commands to the neck and your head. And then the hypoglossal nerve uh, controls your tongue. And it's important that there's like one nerve controlling kind of tongue and pharyngeal you have glossopharyngeal, but the hypoglossal controls your tongue because your tongue has to do a lot of fine movement in order for you to make vocalizations, to speak. So we already talked a little bit about the spinal nerves, 31 pairs, eight cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral, one coccygeal, 31 pairs. Take sensory information into the spinal cord where something will happen to it. It, it will either elicit a reflex or it'll just send information up to the brain and then motor commands out to skeletal muscle. Okay, now in terms of an autonomic nervous system, ah, the autonomic nervous system are all the automatic actions that happen without you having to think about it. So it's like the resting tone of smooth muscle, the cardiac muscle doing its thing at a certain rate based on what your respiratory needs are, regulatory functions of the body, uh, elimination, things like that, anything that's involuntary. The autonomic neurons of our body are called preganglionic or postganglionic neurons. What these guys do is they interact with the ganglia along the edge of the spinal cord to allow us to signal either broad activations or broad I don't want to say depressions, but let's just talk about activation, broad activations of actions because something needs to happen. It's really hard to describe this without a picture. Here we go. I needed to come over here. Um, so when you're looking at the sympathetic nervous system, we have these sympathetic chain ganglia here on the side postganglionic neurons. The postganglionic neurons are going to take information out to different parts of the body like the adrenal glands, the stomach, um, the respiratory structures like the lungs, the eyes, the ciliary muscles of the eyes. And what happens is if something happens that you need to fight or flight, these sympathetic chain ganglia can turn on or mass activate a number of different targets at the same time to turn things up 
So let's say you need, uh, we're hiking in Yosemite and a bear comes running down the hill and it's looking really hungry and it's looking at you, okay? First thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna go, ah, right? And your eyes are gonna dilate, the pupil's gonna dilate so you can take in more information. Your heart rate's gonna increase. You'll probably get a dilation of, bron of uh, in the bronchial so that you can get more air into your lungs. At the same time, you're gonna see a decrease in the motility of your digestive system because this isn't a time to digest your food. It's a time to run away, right? This is fight or flight. And so when sympathetic activation occurs, the sympathetic chain ganglia, the postganglionic neurons, turn on to coordinate fight or flight. That's really what's going on. And it's difficult to explain it with a bunch of slides, okay? And that's why I went forward. So the postganglionic neurons of the autonomic nervous system are turning on fight or flight. So it's gonna help regulate functions so that we can maintain ourselves and quickly get back to homeostasis. Uh, lots of visceral effectors are doubly innervated. You don't need to worry about that right now. Our visceral, visceral effectors are tissues that the autonomic nervous system talks to, like cardiac and smooth muscle, glandular tissue. And so the sympathetic nervous system consists of the thora, uh, thoracolumnar division. These are spinal nerves that go through your thoracic spinal area and your lumbar spinal area. Short preganglionic, long postganglionic, I'm not gonna bug you about that. I am not gonna bug you about acetylcholine, norepinephrine, but you do need to know that sympathetic is fight or flight, okay? Parasympathetic is rest and digest. I'm sure you've already talked about that. They do exactly the opposite. The cranial nerves actually selectively turn on your urinary system, GI mobility, reproductive function, digestion, and it down regulates the uh, activation of the ciliary muscle of the eye. It down regulates your heart rate. You're kind of relaxed, you're resting and digesting. And so what that means is instead of these sympathetic chain ganglia being activated, they're just kind of mellow. They're not doing anything. Instead, you have these green regions here, the preganglionics turning on the colon and the bladder doing their business, increased mobility or motility inside of the small intestine, increased secretion in the stomach, secretion of digestive enzymes, slowing down your heart rate, the constriction of bronchioles, all right? Uh, secretion of saliva, right? If you're gonna be resting and digesting, you might as well have some saliva going along there so you can swallow your food. So the way I memorized all of this in the beginning, postganglionic is sympathetic. I don't wanna say simp, but yeah, which is fight or flight. Preganglionics are parasympathetic. And this is rest and digest. It's a lot more complicated than that though. So there are usually what we call uh, two neuron relays, preganglionic, postganglionic fibers that talk to each other for this. I am not gonna bug you about that too much, but the idea basically is that here is a cell body in the preganglionic neuron coming out here to the sympathetic chain ganglia. Remember the sympathetic chain ganglia right here? This is fight or flight. Over here is rest and digest. What are the neurotransmitters? Acetylcholine, ad noradrenaline, norepinephrine. I'm not gonna bug you about that too much, but if you're interested, you can study those on your own. So what happens when you have a disorder of the autonomic nervous system? Well, it can actually cause problems with uh, heart disease, digestive problems for sure. Um, it can cause issues with the immune system or reduced uh, resistance to disease. So basically, long extended periods of stress, we all know, make you not feel so good, makes you really tired. But over time, let's say, for example, uh, in in areas where uh, people have been exposed to uh, drought, famine, war, prolonged excessive periods of time uh, of stress causes pretty serious dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system in that rest and digest just doesn't trigger as easily. People live in a high stress, anxiety, uh, 
state and they'll end up with uh, digestive disorders, ulcers, because they keep continuously producing stomach acid at the wrong time and it's kind of a mess. All right, you guys made it through this lecture. We're going to go through sensory structures next, so I'll catch you on the next chapter.